good morning and so glad to uh, to be here uh, to share with you from God's Word. Um, KJ asked me to give a brief, um, just family update. As many of you know, um, <clears throat> we are back in Tennessee for a little while for an extended trip. And um, uh, not, not necessarily for a, a, a happy reason, uh, my mom unexpectedly passed away um, two, two Fridays ago uh, after a surgery, um, after a surgery that was successful. Um, but uh, shortly after uh, the surgery was finished, um, thankfully before they woke her, they were beginning to wake, wake her up out of her anesthesia and uh, beginning to get ready to transport her to her recovery room. Um, she had a sudden a rupture of her aorta and uh, they couldn't do anything. Uh, just, uh, you know, when that happens, there's, there's very little chance of survival. And uh, come to find, find out that this is actually very common. My mom had a thing called Turner syndrome, made her very short. She was four foot five, four foot six. You can imagine me growing up with a, with a, you know, being at my mom's level until about age five or six and then always looking down. Um, but, uh, but uh, this is just a very common thing for people who have her condition. And so, uh, and apparently many of them could have, uh, many of them have statistically lived maybe as, as short as a few years as like 17 years old. Many, many people with this condition die. Um, 35, 45, more, more typical. My mom had 65 years and we had 65 years with her. Uh, I'm just so grateful for that. Um, but it's been hard and it's been uh, just overwhelming. Sometimes uh, you don't know how to feel um, when this kind of thing happens. Um, and we've just been so uh, sustained and encouraged by so many of you who have sent notes for us, um, who have prayed for us. Um, and yeah, just, just I'm, I'm so overwhelmed with the love of our friends and family in the church. And we just... Uh, we're just thankful. Thankful, too, to get to be here extended time, about two months or so, to spend time with family, and especially my dad, uh, to be with him right now and try to just let him have a good time with the grandkids, uh, to encourage him, sit with him. Uh, we just felt that with confinement still kind of slowly rolling out into the deconfinement stage, um, it just made sense for us to, to be able to come here and, and, and rest here and be here a little bit. So we're going to continue to minister with our church family in Paris. I'm uh, happy and thankful to get to share God's word with you today, and um, we have a we have a a little bit of a hard passage to jump back into, and we are beginning. It's a special day because we're beginning uh, back into our series uh, in First Peter, which we took a pause when confinement uh, began. And today, KJ has asked me to continue and jump right back into our series, and we're going to be in First Peter chapter three, verses eighteen through twenty-two. So I'm going to go ahead and read that and pray for us and invite you to open your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. So here's what it says, the word of the Lord. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. All right, would you pray with me as we ask for God's help uh, to understand his word? Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be together around your word. Uh, Lord, in a spirit of, of worship, Lord, in a, in, a, in a posture of humility and, and of asking uh, for your help to understand, uh, Lord, these, these great mysteries of your salvation and the mystery of, of what Jesus, uh, Lord, was accomplishing in his death and his resurrection and how that relates to us. Lord, we pray especially just for uh, a deep-rooted awe and wonder, uh, Lord, as we look at this text, that would lead us to live lives of holiness. 
and that would lead us to live, Lord, in the light of your grace. Lord, let us not uh, fall into just wanting to speculate and, and talk, Lord, but help us to want to uh, trust, Lord, and to live for your glory. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, so I, I want you to, before we get into kind of looking at each verse um, and, and trying to pick apart what Peter is getting at here, I want you to imagine an archaeologist. And I want you to imagine, you know, this, maybe this, you know, short little guy with a hat. He's got a really good scraggly beard. And uh, maybe in, in modern day Syria or Turkey, digging around in caves, right? Looking for artifacts. And I want you to imagine this guy uh, kind of one morning, kind of, you know, maybe not expecting much. He's been digging for a while and, and, and uh, you know, nothing but just broken, broken pottery uh, so far is what he's finding. And all of a sudden, uh, he finds this container, this, you know, some kind of jar maybe, and, and opens it up. And again, expecting maybe, you know, nothing. Um, but all of a sudden finds a scroll and uh, begins to get excited, right? This is what he lives for, right? To find ancient documents, ancient artifacts. And opens, you know, takes it out very carefully, opens it up, unrolling it so carefully, not wanting anything to fall apart as he opens. And to his wonder and to his amazement, he sees characters, he sees, he sees letters, right? And of course, he's like a master linguist. You know, he has to be if he's doing this job. So he, he's not worried about, can he read this or not? He, he begins to open it. He sees, oh, there's something here. And, and, and the letters are, are visible. He can, he can read them. And he begins to read. Can you imagine the, the, the feeling of, of anticipation and the feeling of mystery that this guy is going to have as he opens up this ancient text? Maybe previously undiscovered, lost through the centuries, and now he might be the one to rediscover it. I think that sometimes Christians, and, and, and even those who are not Christians, can read the Bible with a, a sort of a, a lack of wonder. Uh, unlike this man who, who knows he's, he's, he's delving into the ancient mysteries of the world, potentially, and could discover something that, that changes our view of history or our understanding of ancient cultures, we can kind of, uh, for, for good reason, for, for a good pastoral reason, we can kind of dumb down the scripture sometime because we care about people. We want people to understand. We want to make it digestible and at a, at a, at a, at a, at a level where people can understand. And I have that same heart. But I think because of that, if we overemphasize that, sometimes we can miss the fact that we are dealing with an ancient text and that there are mysteries here. Well, there's no mistaking today as you read First Peter that we are dealing with mysteries. Martin Luther famously said of this verse, uh, this is a wonderful passage in First Peter. I have no idea what it means. <laughs> so if, if Martin Luther uh, said that, uh, we, you know, this kind of causes our ears to perk up a little bit. What, what, what is this about? What is Peter getting at? There, he says two things in here, the two middle sections of this passage, which are very difficult to get our minds around. Um, well, we're going to try to do today uh, to, to, to walk through this text with that sense of mystery and wonder. And we're going to try to understand and grasp what he's getting at, what he's telling us. And I want you to know that I think there is some mystery here. But I also want you to know, I think there's something very clear. And this could be the sermon right here. And you, and you, you could just end the live stream and, and just wrestle with this. Peter is calling us clearly to look to Jesus. Have you heard that phrase before? Have you been looking to Jesus? Now that deconfinement is starting in France and here in the U.S., people are getting tired of confinement and just wanting to break free and resume normal life. Uh, are we looking to Jesus just as much as we did when we first started uh, this process? And, and maybe, maybe some of us began to wrestle a little more with our relationship with God, our, our faith. Maybe we started to lean in a little more on the Lord because of the difficult circumstances, and maybe now we're wanting to go back to normal life and, and get on autopilot. Peter's calling us to look to Jesus is clear. Even with the mysteries here, 
And what I want to say is, if you can hang and try to grasp these mysteries that are spoken of, I think it's going to make all the more difference for our appreciation of the Jesus that we look to, for our sense of awe at the marvel and the mystery of this great Savior in whom we have placed our trust and have staked our lives on. And that's what we're going to see today. So look first at verse at verse 18, I think we see clearly Peter begins calling us to look to Jesus in his suffering. So what does he say? For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. In the, in the context, if you look just one verse before this, it seems that he's, he's making a comparison, right? In verse 17, he says it's better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So, so from that last kind of challenge, right? Hey, if you're going to suffer, let it be for doing good. Don't be a troublemaker. In verse 18, he immediately picks up and, and, and begins to remind us of the greater importance of why, why this matters. Well, it's because Christ also suffered. And, and he suffered not as, a, not as a guilty person who deserved to suffer. He suffered as the only innocent one. The only innocent and righteous man. And his suffering, as evil men were assaulting him, opposing his message, opposing his, his life and ministry, and opposing the disciples as well, Jesus was resolutely walking forward towards the completion of his mission, and that was to go to the cross. You read all the Gospels, it is clear that the one singular devoted passion of Jesus Christ, the God-man, was to go to that cross, was to fulfill his purpose of making atonement for sin. That's what Peter says here, the righteous for the unrighteous. We call this in, in, in Christian teaching, or Martin Luther actually, again, uh, famously coined this phrase, the great exchange. I had a dream last night where uh, uh, a bunch of us were singing, and really, really pretty singing too. <clears throat> uh, one of my favorite songs, What Wondrous Love Is This? And if you look at the lyrics, it's, it's really profound. It's just, it just speaks about this great exchange. What wondrous love is this? What wondrous love is this? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the sinful shame for my soul, for my soul? Right? When he says, he goes on further, when I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down beneath God's righteous frown, Christ laid aside his crown for my soul, for my soul. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. Is this vision of Jesus on the cross in his suffering, resolutely walking towards that goal of fulfillment of God's purposes to rescue us, to redeem us, to forgive us? Is this the Jesus we're looking to? Peter calls us to look to Jesus and his suffering. And it's to bring us home. You see that, he says, so that we might be brought to God. But notice here the emphasis, again, we have to just keep moving because there's a lot here. Um, Peter emphasizes here he was put to death in the flesh, right? In the flesh he suffered. You too, you're going to suffer in the flesh. As we suffer, we're encouraged. Jesus suffered. But notice, as death is working out its principle in Jesus' life through suffering for the purpose of bringing life, what is happening? Life is coming by the Holy Spirit. Life is coming by the Spirit. It says here in the end of verse 18, being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the Spirit. So life was working its way out and, and, it, and it reached its climax in the moment of death when Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished. When he bore that weight of your guilt on the cross and said, it is finished. Their, their sin is atoned for. They can be welcomed in the Spirit was even more so bringing Jesus to life. 
Death was not uh, something that could hold him. And so we see um, this next point in looking at verse 19. We see the continuation of this. What happened? And this is, this is where we start getting into mystery. What happened when Jesus died? We'll look at verse 19. So he's made alive in the Spirit. Seems to be possibly speaking of Jesus um, in those moments after death and, and in the three days that he was in the earth, right? That he was buried. In which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. What is this about? Uh, these, these verses are, are debated and, and contested and, and hard to understand. Uh, I'm just going to give you some possible um, ways to look at them. But, but first, I want to call your attention to the fact that Jesus does speak about, and he compares this time um, in the three days that he was buried. Right? He speaks about this in, in the Gospels. He compares his time um, in the ground to the time that Jonah was in the whale. In, in, in foretelling of his death and, and of his real physical death and the real physical burial that he would go through, he tells his, his uh, opponents, he says, just as the Son of Man, or sorry, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days and then will rise. It's interesting if you look at Jonah, uh, you look at chapter 2, when Jonah is thrown in the water, there is this uh, experience that Jonah has uh, that, you know, in, in the kids' version, we, we say, you know, okay, he, he, was, he was in the belly of the whale. Um, and I believe that's possible. But you look at the language there, and the way Jonah describes his experience, it sounds a lot more like death. It sounds a lot more, more like what Jesus is saying. He talks about how the waves of death were encompassing him. The cords of Sheol were, were entangling him. And he cried out to God in his despair. Jonah, when he experienced his three days, was in despair. He was, he was in darkness. Uh, it, it led to a great humbling for him, which propelled him to his recovery and his, his fulfillment of his mission to go preach to Nineveh. Jesus wasn't like that. Jesus, in contrast to Jonah, was not in despair and darkness in those three days. We can say that with assurance. Jesus was victorious. We, we are to look to the Jesus, look to Jesus who is victorious even in death. And Peter wants us to know that, um, that as we are going through what feels like death, maybe as we are going through what, what Jonah was going through, maybe feeling forsaken, maybe during suffering, during hard times, feeling lost, crying out to God. Peter wants us to see this Jesus victorious in death. And he wants that to help us as we hold on to hope. Now, what, what about these spirits? What, what, is, what is Jesus doing in death? Right? If he's victorious or in death, what does this victory look like? What is he doing? Uh, we don't want to over-speculate. We don't know. We don't know everything, but Peter does seem to be talking about it here. And what does he seem to be saying? He seems to be saying that Jesus was preaching. That he was preaching in some sense. And uh, that this preaching uh, was to a certain group. So he's not talking about everything Jesus did when he was in the grave, but he's speaking about one thing he did. And for a reason, of course, again, to encourage us. But there's a lot of debate because the, the people that he's preaching to, first of all, it says spirits, and then it says they're in prison, and then it relates these spirits in prison to the time of Noah. And uh, I'll give you two options. You can choose to, to believe what you want to believe about this verse and, and make your best guess about what Peter is talking about. But one uh, good, likely uh, option is that Peter is speaking about uh, the, the wicked generation of Noah. That Jesus is speaking to this wicked generation, and um, as believers, we don't believe he's offering any kind of forgiveness or offer of salvation or or, for, or you know a second chance. Uh, 
but that he's he's preaching in a sense uh, the gospel that God has been victorious right Noah was a righteous servant of God in their day they opposed him they mocked him uh, the, the Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness so he was he was a prophet uh, they all thought he was crazy and then the flood came and he was proven right uh, but Jesus may be coming here to these to these uh, spirits of the rebellious and the wicked generation of Noah and and proclaiming and vindicating Noah and proclaiming even more so that this was all leading to the ultimate vindication that that God is just he is judged that he is good that he will reign his kingdom will reign and Jesus would be proclaiming in a sense that this has been finished the cross is done he will be raised and the shores of salvation will be available to all who would trust in him that's possible I I lean towards the second interpretation which is that this is speaking of um, evil spirits and and mainly because there are several passages which seem to uh, parallel this one one if you want to look at later uh, second Peter uh, both chapters 2 and 3 kind of talk about the this passage or parallel this passage look at the book of Jude right after Peter and uh, Jude only has, only has one chapter but in Jude you see Jude talking about these evil spirits and then in the Old Testament Genesis chapter 6 and then there's also another um, non canonical book called First Enoch that uh, we don't believe is inspired but Jude refers to it Peter seems to be alluding to it uh, in this case Jesus is proclaiming the same thing, God's message of victory, that he has conquered, he has overcome. And you imagine if, this is, if these are evil spirits that have been imprisoned for their rebellion, right, fallen angels. Um, you imagine this picture of Jesus, again, victorious in death, entering into the floodwaters of death, and, and, and not like Jonah, being in despair and darkness, but victoriously in his perfect light going forward and proclaiming his victory and, and I could just imagine you know the scene of behold I'm the lion of the tribe of Judah I am the star of Jacob I am David's descendant I am the lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world and your rebellion your unbelief right whether this is spirits or men your unbelief is stands condemned and my victory and the faith of my servants stands vindicated you have rejected the only hope of God and I have come to declare his victory his glory his salvation can we look to a Jesus like that can we look to a Jesus who is victorious even in death we need to have a big picture of our Lord. And Peter gives us that, again, to encourage us as we hold on to hope. In our day, I'm afraid many of us see Jesus more as an accessory to our lives. The world wants us to believe in Jesus if he's just an accessory. If this is just a private spiritual conviction that you have that maybe Jesus really was who he said he was, God calls us to a wholehearted trust in this powerful, victorious Savior. And this is where Peter goes in the next verse. If you look at verse verses 20 and 21, so it says, Because they formerly did not, did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is our second mystery. Uh, Peter says something that every Protestant uh, trembles to hear, right? Baptism saves you. Um, I, this is not a problem for us. I think we, we have plenty of reason to believe uh, what we believe about baptism, but I'll try to walk through that. What, what is Peter getting at? Well, again, I want you to see, first of all, he's again continuing this theme of looking at Christ. Look at Jesus. Look to Jesus in the flood. 
because we need reassurance that we will find safe passage home. Right? He saw in verse 18, he began with that, that Jesus suffered in order to bring us to God. Well, there's going to be a, a likely question in your life and in my life when things get difficult, when we face opposition, where we say, yes, yes, I believe that, but in our heart of hearts, we really are wondering whether God can bring us home. When life feels like a flood, right, of, of trial, suffering, of discouragement, maybe of, of people questioning us, making fun of our faith, mocking all these things, uh, we can begin to have this, this doubt in our hearts. Well, can God really bring me home? And Peter wants us to look to Jesus again and, and, and to know. Well, specifically, he calls us to look at uh, Jesus in light of our baptism. So, so let's just try to understand this here. So he says baptism at the beginning of verse 21 corresponds to this. What is the this? What is baptism corresponding to? Well, it seems to be corresponding to, again, safe passage. This is a little bit tricky for us because water in our day, uh, I think many of us think of water as a purifying thing, right? And certainly in the Bible, there are connotations of that, right? We, we talked about, I, talk, I preached on John 4, Jesus offers living water to the woman at the well. That living water representing a wellspring of life, right? Coming out of the person's heart who would trust in Christ and receive the Holy Spirit. Well, as much as that's true in, in living water, and we think of some other passages like Naaman, where he is purified, right? Where the, I think Elijah tells him to go and purify himself and cleanse himself of his leprosy, right, in the spring. There's another side of this in the scripture where water represents death. Again, we think of this flood imagery, right? What happened in the flood? The unrighteous were washed away. In the very beginning chapters of the Bible, what is it in, in creation that is, that, is, that is there before all the goodness of what God creates? It's, it's this sea, this, this chaotic, churning water, and the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters like a bird over its nest, is the connotation in, that, in the original Hebrew. So water has this, this, this image for, for the biblical authors of chaos and of death. You can think of Jonah in his time in the water. Well, baptism has that same connotation. Look at Romans 6. I'll just read this. The imagery here, Romans 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it. Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, think of the water, buried therefore with him in baptism, with him in baptism, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might walk in newness of life. So baptism has this imagery not of going through the water to be purified, necessarily, by the water. And Peter says that, not as remove, removal of dirt from the body, right? He acknowledges it removes dirt, but that's not the point of baptism. The point is to identify with Christ, to confess his name, and to identify him symbolically by entering into the water, therefore submitting ourselves to the flood, right? to death, and then because we're putting our trust in him, just like the ark, right, just like Noah getting in the ark, we are putting our trust in Christ to give us safe passage through the waters because he has gone on ahead of us to the shores of salvation and the new creation that awaits. And so we have assurance as we go and are buried with him, just as we are dying to ourselves and submitting to suffering and to the opposition of the world, because we're aligning ourselves with God's kingdom, so too we have assurance we will be raised with him, and that there's a new life that awaits. This is what Peter's saying. He's saying baptism corresponds to this, right? Noah got in the ark, 
by faith. I'm sure he built a really good ark, and I'm sure it was very, very, uh, you know, secure, and he felt secure in it. But what was he hoping in? Was he hoping in the ark to deliver him? No, he knew the sovereign Lord was going to get him through. He didn't place his faith in the wood. He placed his faith in God. And so too, baptism corresponds to this, that for a Christian, we are, if you are a Christian, you have been baptized as a believer, or if you're not a Christian, how do I become a Christian? Well, we want to encourage you. You know, many churches today say, you know, pray a prayer of confessing your sins to God and of, of asking Jesus to come into your heart. We want to say, yes, pray that prayer. But what is the moment of putting your entire life's stake on the ground and identifying with Jesus and saying, I am his and I want him to be mine and I want to give up my old ways and my old life. I want to die to that and I want to receive that new life that he has promised. It's baptism. It's baptism. It's not the water, but it is the moment of confession of the faith and of identification through entering the water and rising again to say that we are pledging, this is what Peter says, we're pledging our consciences to God. We're, we, are, we are asking for new life in his name, but we're also, we're also going through baptism because we know that we've already received it. Does that make sense? We can talk about this more in our home groups. I think there's a lot to say here. There's a lot I can't really get into right now. But again, we see that baptism corresponds to this deliverance. And again, I want you to picture this. The flood waters of death, right? The judgment of God is coming. Where do you find refuge? Where do you find refuge? It's in Christ. It's in fleeing to Him, in, in casting your life in everything, putting every stake that you have, every claim that you have on Him. And it's, it involves putting no confidence in anything of yourself. That's why we say salvation is... By, by faith alone, through repentance. Repentance is putting away the past and turning to God, and faith is grabbing hold of Him. And baptism so beautifully portrays that picture. And so we do believe it's, a, it's something we, we care about. We want to see people baptized. We want to see people gladly, joyfully confessing the name of Christ, saying, I'm putting my hope in Him, we want to see them going in those waters to symbolize their act of faith of dying to themselves and rising out of those waters to walk in newness of life by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by water. Um, so again, we see this. Look to Jesus through the flood because he will bring us safely home. Just in conclusion, I, I want to ask you, to again, notice here, look at the last verse. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, verse 22, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Again, I've said this is all about looking to Jesus, even though there's mystery here, because you notice from the very beginning in verse 18 all the way to here, there's a progression of Jesus on the cross Jesus in his death proclaiming victory over evil in the vindication of God's people, those who trust in him by faith. Then you see again this, this picture of safe passage through the waters of judgment into life and new creation. And then finally Peter ends with Jesus resurrected and exalted at the right hand of God. Do you see the progression there? Do you see how this really is all about Jesus? Here's the challenge for us. What I two questions. What kind of Jesus do you worship and follow? I, I just don't want us to be mistaken and, and miss the fact that there are a lot of versions of Jesus that are peddled in our day. Many of them cannot bring you safely home. Many of them uh are offered as 
an accessory to your life. Maybe Jesus who will make you rich. Maybe Jesus who will never let you get sick again. Maybe the Jesus who really is your buddy and always has your back. Maybe it's the Jesus who wasn't really on the cross. The Jesus who, you know, didn't really teach all those things about God's judgment, about hell. Maybe it's the Jesus who looks more like a hippie than a warrior king. There's all sorts of, of pictures of Jesus, and, and the challenge for all of us is to continue to grow in our understanding of the true nature and character of Christ. That's a process. None of us have it perfect. But let's not fool ourselves into buying into one of these half-hearted messiahs that are offered to us to give us comfort. The true comfort comes when we take hold of the real and living Christ. And I believe Peter here is, is calling us to look at him and to see that he is far more glorious. His victory is far more powerful than we can even imagine. I just, again, if you look at the two mysterious parts of this passage, uh, you think of the trembling that the evil spirits had when they encountered Jesus during his ministry in the Gospels. I know who you are, the Son of God. What do you have to do with us? And you imagine this victorious Jesus, exalted now at the right hand of God, calling us to worship, calling us to persevere, calling us to walk forward in faith and not in fear. Again, I'm afraid many of us, myself included, are going to be very tempted right now to want to just return to normal life. Let's get back to normal life. Let's get back on my life. That's not an option for the Christian. It's not my life. In those waters of baptism, you and I gave up our lives. And we traded it, the great exchange. We traded our lives for the life and the righteousness of Christ. We put off the old clothes of sin and shame and guilt, and we put on the new robe of righteousness, what Jesus has done for us. And he cleansed us by the power, not of water, but of the Holy Spirit. He washed us through regeneration so that we might walk in newness of life. If this passage is hard to understand, I want to read this from Hebrews chapter 10. And hopefully this will, in some ways, sum up the same thing that Peterson is saying. And I want to encourage us with this again as we, as we conclude today, as we walk forward as a church. What's our mindset? Listen to this. Therefore, brothers, chapter 10 in Hebrews, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, right? We long to be together again, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day of Christ drawing near. I want to leave you with that today. I, I pray that that's our heart. I pray that's my heart. Again, I want to thank you all for so many thoughtful messages and prayers, and um, uh, we could not carry this burden right now. I could not carry it without your support, um, and I just uh, want you to know that. How much more as we go forward are we going to need each other as we walk in this world? But who can bring us home? He can. He can bring us home. I pray you're encouraged today and bless you now in Jesus' name. Thank you all for joining us. And we look forward to discussing this more uh, in this week to come as we have our uh, online home groups. All right, we love you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.